Hello. Welcome. Thank you. Wow. I had a bit of a moment when I realised I had to do this, that I had not to fangirl you, like, on stage. I'm going to do a really bad job of that. Uh, what Vin hasn't told you, which is to me the most in some ways remarkable bit about not only being the father of the internet, he landed in our country at 8 o'clock this morning, got to Canberra at 10.30 this morning, had a lunch forum with a whole bunch of people from 12.30 until 2, and is now here and just did that. So, so yeah, exactly. There's, there's a secret. There's a secret to this. Oh, it does two, it involve two, coffee? Two, two, two. One secret is stay on Vince Surf time. And the second one is 900 mile an hour theory, which is once you get going up to 900 miles an hour, don't slow down and don't stop because you'll just fall over. So <laughs> just keep going. You know? I'm not sure that scales quite like the internet does. <laughs> so for me, there were four things I really wanted to ask you. We're going to see if we can get through it okay. in time. First thing was, we talked about this a little bit earlier today, but one of the things I'm always amazed by is people's job descriptions, what that means you do every day. So, Vin, among many other things, is the chief evangelizer of the internet. Chief internet evangelizer. Chief internet evangelizer. Yeah, I don't evangelize about everything, just about the internet. Yeah, well, I do know that means every time you go to Russia, they ask you if you believe in God. I'm not going to ask you that. Oh. Um, but I am going to ask you, what does a chief internet evangelizer do on a day-to-day -day basis? What's that job and how do the rest of us get it? So, uh, I mentioned earlier today that I didn't actually ask for the title. The title I asked for was Archduke. <laughs> and and, and they, Larry and Eric and Sergey said, you know, the previous Archduke was Ferdinand and he was assassinated in 1914 and it started World War I. Maybe that's a bad title to have. So they said, why don't you be our chief internet evangelist? And I said, okay, I can do that. So um, the primary role, uh, frankly, is to work uh, to get more internet built around the world. And that means going to places where there isn't any. Uh, so you've come to Canberra? Well, <laughs> uh, I, I heard about the NBN. <laughs> We'll have this act all night. <laughs> so, uh, in fact, though, believe it or not, only about half of the world is online, and there's still another 3.8 billion people to convert. Uh, there are places where the governments need to be persuaded that either investment by the government is needed or at least policies that will encourage investment are needed. But even more important, I think, now um, is not just the building of infrastructure that can support internet, but also uh, attention to making the internet useful for people, you know, quali quantitatively as well as qualitatively useful, whether that means improved health care, uh, improved income, uh, improved living conditions, a variety of things that we would want the internet to demonstrate in a, a concrete way. Uh, information of local value, information in local languages, things like that. So that's part of my pitch when I go around the world talking about policy. Um, I've been in the research group at Google as well since my arrival there in 2005, uh, although I recently moved into the policy organization directly. And so I've been party to some of the really interesting uh, research ideas that have come along, many of which have uh, emerged out of internet applications that we and others have been exploring. So uh, it's, this has to be one of the best jobs in the world. It's mostly I have the freedom to poke my nose into almost everything uh, and, uh, and learn. And I don't know about the rest of you, but the more I learn, the more I realize I don't know. And then I regret that I have less time than I would like to learn the stuff that I know I don't know. But, you know, that's just the way it is. Sort of the human condition. Uh, I'm afraid so. So will you talk a little bit about where Google's been going with ethics and AI? I know if you picked up a newspaper in Australia, or frankly in many of the places one might spend time, artificial intelligence has been part and parcel of the conversations we've been having. I think there's been a lot of debate about what it means to think about ethical AI, what would it mean to think about a framework for that. And I noted with some interest that Google had published their first framework for this right. uh, earlier this month. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how that came to be and what you think it stands for and why that matters. So, uh, I, first of all, I have to admit to you that for a long time I always thought AI stood for artificial idiocy. 
Uh, and, you know, there are, you know, like this, some of the strange things I mentioned earlier, the translations that don't quite make it uh, properly. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we have demonstrated some really extraordinary uh, capacity, for example, to uh, understand uh, and distinguish between cells that are diseased and cells that are healthy, or to detect uh, retinal, uh, it's a diabetic retinopathy, for example, by looking at the retinal scans and distinguishing a person with a disease from one who doesn't have it. Those are all machine learning mechanisms. And so I have uh, very optimistic and positive feelings about some of those applications. But at the same time, uh, we and others are seeing the need for transparency because if the algorithms don't work the way we expect them to, we want to be able to understand why not. We want other people to be able to understand that. With regard to uh, artificial intelligence in particular, we recently published a set of principles that we propose to use to assess uh, research efforts and, uh, and business efforts that use artificial intelligence as an important ingredient. For example, a self-driving car company, Waymo, which is a part of the... Google has, has now been structured as a holding company called Alphabet, and Google is one of the companies in that holding company. But Waymo is our self-driving car part of Alphabet. Uh, Calico, the California Life Company, is another one. Uh, Verily, which is a medical instrumentation company, is yet another one. Uh, Calico is interesting because the, they notice that people get old and they're trying to figure out how to stop that. And, of course, I was afraid the engineers would take the obvious solution, you know, okay, <laughs> next problem. Uh, that wasn't what we had in mind. Uh, so, uh, so the AI that we're pursuing um, is intended uh, to produce, um, but, you know, let's say, useful results that augment our own capacity. This is, goes all the way back to Doug Engelbart and J.C.R. Licklider and their belief that computing in its varied forms would allow us to do things that we couldn't normally do as, as human beings. If you think about searching the web uh, and the mechanism that's required to do that, the, the crawling that goes through with our computers to look at every web page, find every word on every web page, index every single web page, uh, and then help you find the web pages that have the words that you're looking for, that's a task that no human being could do, but a bank of computers is, is, uh, can do that for us and help us find what we hope is useful information. So I think that uh, we are, I think we're heading down uh, what I think is a thoughtful path to make sure we don't oversell and overdepend on these AI and machine learning mechanisms. Uh, I hope we're doing a job to educate people about uh, not becoming overly dependent on these things and to be uh, health, have some healthy skepticism about the efficacy of these kinds of, uh, of techniques. Nonetheless, I am persuaded, as are many others, that these are really powerful augmenting capabilities that we should not ignore and should try very, very hard to employ in, in uh, constructive ways. So can you talk a little bit about, so I mean, I'm, I'm interested in why it is that companies want to regulate that and how they'd go about doing it. So I know that your, the principles from Google and Alphabet, or well, there's eight or nine of them, right, about what AI should be in the service of. So in the service of humans, in the service of scientific excellence, designed for privacy by principle. Do you have a sense of how that's going to play out and whether other companies and institutions should be doing that? So... Uh I'm happy to speculate a little bit, although I'm not sure that I can predict anything, I mean, considering I screwed up the address space so badly with the 32 versus the 128. Um, well, you were close with 122 <laughs> countries, sort of. Uh, first of all, I think that it is indicative of the times that Google and others are starting to realize that it's important to think about the consequences of these technologies and not to simply get excited about making things do something new or do something different or do something faster. Uh, and so the fact that we're having that dialogue is, for me is very encouraging. Uh, educating the general public to be a little skeptical of this is equally important. I mean, and, and although you didn't exactly ask this question, uh, uh, like every good graduate student, you distort the question around until you can answer it. Um, so I'll do that too. 
Uh, you didn't mention Bitcoin, but it's a very good example. Or just generally blockchain is another example of hyperbolic technology references, just like AI and machine learning have become very hyperbolic. We should be a little suspicious of all of those things. Uh, and, uh, and although it's good to encourage people to think, you know, uh, out of the box, to think in terms that are non-conventional, at the same time, we shouldn't imbue these things with magic because they're not magic. Uh, so uh, people like you who watch uh, with, you know, the human condition through the anthropological eyes, uh, can help us a lot in two ways. The first one is to remind us that there have been other advances in technology that have changed the way we live our lives. And, you know, it, it wasn't the end of the human race uh, and it wasn't the end of thinking. Can you imagine some people, you, you can imagine this scenario, somebody invents writing and somebody else comes along and says, oh my God, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. People will never remember anything. They'll just write stuff down and then they won't have any memory left. Well, writing has turned out to be a pretty important part of human culture. And the thing I like the most about it is that it lets you communicate with the future, even when you're not there. Of course, you don't get to go back the other way, but at least the idea that you could communicate with someone a thousand years from now, it for me is really exciting. Of course, that's presuming that anybody cares about anything I wrote a thousand years from now. But this notion of being able to retain something like that for me is very exciting. So I'm looking to you actually to help us put in perspective some of these dramatic technologies that show up and maybe help us understand you know, whether we should be fearful, whether we should be, you know, uh, ebullient, whether we should be skeptical, whether we should find a way to be realistic about it. But that's, in a way, something that you can contribute to uh, our understanding of what these technologies might do to our culture and our society. And something else you said earlier today over lunch was that we do not have a single global culture. We have many cultures and they interpret and use technologies in different ways. And understanding that we are not uniform is probably yet another th gift that anthropologists like you can offer to people who are trying to fashion technology uh, for different organizations, different groups of, groupings of people around the world. Which is embarrassingly the first time I met you which happily Vin does not remember, but I remember vividly, uh, at a conference 12 years ago, this week actually, in America. I was the over-dinner keynote, which is never a good place to be because everyone has dessert and you're not a lot less compelling than whatever is on their plate. And I had given a keynote talking about the relationship between technology and culture to a group of computer scientists. And I was basically trying to argue that culture mattered and shaped mm -hmm. the way technology used. And I will confess at that point, I'd been in the tech field for about seven years. I knew as much about the internet as an anthropologist might under those circumstances. And so this man in the front row puts his hand up and everyone kind of stops. And he says, are you suggesting that technology shapes culture? And I went, yeah, I think so. And he's like, hmm, I'm unconvinced. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking, uh-oh. And he's like, do you have other examples? And I'm like, yes, many examples follow. And he's like, hmm. Are you suggesting that different technologies would turn up differently in different cultures? I'm like, kind of. And he's like, mm. And this goes on for 15 minutes. And I, I was oh, getting a hey. bit bolshy because Australian anthropologist. <laughs> yeah. And finally, I decide I'm now the only thing standing between a room full of computer scientists and an open bar. And I called time and basically said, it's been lovely chatting. I should go now. And I come off stage and someone looks at me and says, oh, my God, how could you talk that way to Vince Cerf? <laughs> oh, but it embarrassingly gets better because I say, who's Vince Cerf? <laughs> and they said, the man in the front row, and I'm like, you know, I know it was the man in the front row, but who's Vince Cerf? And my colleague looks at me and says, he invented the internet. And I, had, and I think I said at this point, he has a lot to answer for. <laughs> exactly. <laughs>
No, it's a terrifying thing to admit that you didn't know who it was. Um, but it does lead me to my next question, <laughs> okay. having embarrassed myself publicly, um, which is, I mean, I know there were lots of people involved in how we got from the DARPANET and ARPANET to the internet to where we are now, but looking back on that, what do you think the thing is that most frustrates you about that piece of history? I mean, I know you went yeah, through the unfinished you know, business. Um, well, it, I can think of a, a fairly broad range of things that are frustrating. <laughs> I mean, regulators who don't understand the laws that they're passing and don't understand the technology. I mean, in the US, I've been wanting to write a congressional comic book about how the internet works just so that they can understand <laughs> what they're talking about. Um, we'll we'll um, find you some other audiences for that. Um, but I, th I think if, if there's a frustration here, uh, honestly, it is uh, discovering that human beings are not perfect and that many of them don't have your best interests at heart and they will use these technologies uh, to harm people uh, in a variety of ways, whether it's financial or psychological, cyberbullying. I mean, there's a long list of things that you're all familiar with. Uh, and I don't see any obvious way to uh, inhibit that. So we're, in some sense, here we are, we have this wonderful platform which enables a kind of collaboration and sharing of information like nothing we've ever seen before. We have computers helping us find information and interpret it and maybe massage it in ways that give us new insights. All these wonderful and positive things about this in new environment and yet we have people going around doing all these other bad things. So uh, I f it's almost an annoying distraction to have to sit back and say, how do I uh, inhibit some of those bad behaviors? How do I detect it? How do I make it harder for people to uh, do identity theft and do all the other things that they do? And for me, that's, that is a source of frustration because I'd much rather put energy into doing more constructive uh, kinds of uh, projects and yet I know that if we don't solve those problems that people will lose trust in this environment and they won't want to use it and will lose whatever advantages there are. So uh, I guess this is, this is frustration with the human condition. Uh, there's not much to be done about this. Well there are three things that we can do actually now that I think about it. This is, this is my nostrum for the evening. The first thing you can do is to find a technical means of inhibiting the bad behavior. Sort of like, you know, uh, breathalyzers uh, in the car, people find their way around that, or cars that are smart enough to know that they should stop if they're about to run into something. Those sorts of technical means to um, reduce the likelihood of bad behavior causing trouble. Then there's what we could call post hoc enforcement. We could tell people, these things are not ex are antisocial. These things are not accepted in our society. If we catch you engaging in them, there will be consequences. But if we catch you, so not everyone will be caught, but we make laws and we try to enforce them precisely to say that. If we catch you doing these things, there will be consequences. If there are things that we could agree on globally that we all agree is, is uh, bad for society, then maybe we can even have some global um, capacity to, uh, to visit those consequences on people that cause harm. And then the third thing we can say is, don't do that, it's wrong. And I know that sounds wimpy, but I want to remind you, Brian will recognize this argument, that gravity is the weakest force in the universe that we know about right now. And yet when you have significant mass, it's a very powerful force. So when social uh, gatherings, when, when polities agree on certain principles, that can have a very powerful force on individuals. It's peer pressure, uh, it's norms. And so we're starting to see some norms beginning to arise in this online environment, which I hope will help to corral some of the baser uh, behaviors that we encounter. So we had a long conversation at lunchtime with, you know, a number of Australian leaders. And I think running through that, I heard a real thread of anxiety, I don't know if you did, about 
the future, about technology, about what it means for our societies, our families, our cultures, all that kind of thing. And I was really sort of struck by thinking about it's easy to have that conversation. It's much harder to get to action. And whilst I you know, might be an anthropologist in a university, I'm still kind of oriented to the notion that we should build a future we want to live in rather than agonizing about what it might be like. And I guess I wanted to take advantage of it being you and it being here to say, what's the sort of the one or two things we can do as individual citizens or groups of citizens to help build a world we want to live in? So there's all the ways we can critique it, but I also think there's the kind of, you've got, what, about 300, 400 people in this room? You told them they all needed to call their service providers. Yes. And ask about whether they have IPv6. IPv6, yes. Um, you should, I wrote that down. That would, you will go do this, but I'm wondering what else. that may be a million messages going to Telstra for all I know, but that would be good. And, you know, and, and Transact and a few other people. Yeah. Um, they'll be bewildered, but that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering what other one or two things you would suggest that we could do as, as citizens, not as consumers, but as citizens to help kind of activate things and have a little less anxiety and a bit more action. Well, the first thing would be be serious about digital literacy. Uh, and I, I, let me just give you some examples of what I think a digitally literate person would understand. The first one is the fragility of digital content. The fact that even though it seems like bits are ethereal and they would never wear out, the fact is that the medium that they're put into is not guaranteed to last for very long. And as an anthropologist, and maybe even as an archeologist, uh, you could realize that um, even though we record things digitally, like all the pictures that we take in our mobile phones, and we seem to pretend like they'll last forever, they're always there whenever we're looking for them until they aren't. And so digital literacy in, in this case means knowing and understanding that these media need to be catered to. They need to be, you need to copy bits into new media. Uh, to be honest, when people say, what should I do with all my digital photos? I tell them, take the ones that you care the most about and print them on really good quality photographic paper. And the reason I tell them this is that we know for sure that those will last at least 150 years. We're less sure about any digital medium. But I can guarantee you, I'm thinking and working very hard trying to find ways of assuring preservation of digital content. We need business models. Uh, we may need to emulate old hardware to run old operating systems, to run old applications to, re, you know, to resuscitate digital content. Uh, so there are a bunch of things that need to be done uh, along those lines, and you should be conscious of that. You should be aware of that risk. Uh, I think also uh, this... So, so wait, let me just pause there. One strategy for managing a digital world is to make it physical again. I'm sorry, say it may, may... I said one way to manage the digital world is to make it physical again. Yeah, in a sense, yes. Well, it, it, no, the, the digital world is physical. I mean, Fair. we think about it as metaphysical, thanks to Gibson and cyberspace. Yeah. The cloud. But it's, it's realized in physical devices that work the way people like Brian understand. Uh, I don't, but Brian does. I mean, all these little funny things going on, tunnels and so on, and protons and neutrons and electrons are buzzing around and doing their thing, and then they don't. And when they don't, the digital stuff disappears. So it's manifested in physical ways, and we need to literally rejuvenate uh, the, uh, the content in different media as time goes on, as technology changes. But the other thing that I would urge you to uh, keep in mind is this, this critical thinking notion. We are not strangers to critical thinking. We're even not strangers to information overload. Even before the internet, probably no one in this room read every book that was published, read every magazine, watched every movie, saw every television show. We didn't. How did we cope? How did we cope with this avalanche? Well, the answer is we didn't read everything. Uh, we, we relied on our friends uh, to tell us things that they thought were worth reading. We relied on sources we trusted. Those are hard to come by these days. Um, to tell us that we should pay attention to this, this, and this because it had uh, good provenance. So <clears throat> I think we need to revive this uh, willingness 
to look for trustable sources that help guide us to decide what we should consume, what we should reject, what we should evaluate. And I think if we do that, we will do ourselves a big favor and we will probably manage to blunt some of the negative side effects of the uh, abuse of social networks. So I think those are two nice pieces of advice. Think about digital literacy and work out how to activate and encourage critical thinking. And it's nice to be saying that inside you know, Australia's only national university. And I'm gonna call time because you've been now up at the speed of 900 miles an hour for a very long time. And I want to thank you so much for coming to the ANU, for visiting us here and spending your time with us. No, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we have one last piece of business. It's my very great honour to uh, deliver the vote of thanks and make some closing remarks uh, for today's session. Uh, so thank you very much, Vint, for um, a truly inspiring and extremely interesting talk, as well as uh, a fascinating and candid conversation with, with Genevieve. Um, and today's uh, date for your presentation is actually a very auspicious one. Um, Three days ago was the 23rd of June, and the 23rd of June is special for two reasons. The first is that it's interna the International Day for Engineering Women. Hey. Yes. Yay. Um, and the other reason is that 29 years and three days ago, the internet came to Australia. Oh, that's right. Wow. Uh, and uh, the story of how it came to Australia is actually an interesting and important one. So, and like all good stories, it starts with people complaining about ANU a a professors. Uh, and we go back in time to the 1960s when uh, ANU professors used to come back from America telling uh, stories of strange and mystical lands where uh, Vint and his colleagues were making the internet. Uh, and they would come back and they would say, this is a really remarkable and powerful thing and we need to start thinking about this. Fast forward to the 1970s uh, and they were starting to get a little bit agitated. They were concerned that Australia was missing out and they were concerned that really important things were happening and we were going to lose our best and brightest to the rest of the world. Uh, I suspect actually that what was actually going on was that they were yearning to join that story. Come to the 1980s and people had started to take action. Uh, smart people were starting to build local networks, usually in universities, uh, and those networks were uh, handwritten for the hardware that they sat on. They were not connected to any other things, and in fact there were stories of people having eight computers on one desk so that they could actually talk to all eight networks in their uh, university. And then we come to another hardy band of pioneering Australians who uh, decided that they were going to get over their institutional and technical differences, and like good pragmatic Australians, they were going to cobble together a, a coalition of people from universities. They got CSIRO involved, and uh, they went to the Australian Research Council to seek funding to create Australia's first internet. Um, and so the internet came to Australia for the princely sum of $1.77 million. Uh, and then two blokes in an office at the ANU Computer Centre, bought 30-odd routers, got in a car, and drove around Australia for six weeks. And that's how we got the internet. Uh, <laughs> that's a great story. <laughs> so it's, it's a very typically Australian story. Um, and one of the things to think about there is that, in fact, there was very limited strategic uh, insight and direction from uh, government. What uh, was happening was that there was a, a two, two generations of pioneering Australians who wanted to make this happen. The rest, as they say, is history. So traffic on that uh, nascent internet um, doubled every eight months for the next five years. Yes. And uh, suddenly the vice chancellors of Australia realised that they were sitting on top of uh, a very large commercial company and they didn't actually feel qualified to operate it. So they sold it. Uh, and interestingly, um, they sold it to Telstra, who... Uh, in the early 1980s wanted no part of this thing. Uh, neither did government. And so Australia got an internet because of uh, fearless, far-sighted academic leaders as well as pioneering computer scientists. Uh, and 
That is an interesting tale for us to understand. You will have noticed that we got the internet 20 odd years after the rest of the world did. And so I'd like to conclude by thanking you, not just for your talk, not just for the internet, but for creating worlds that visionary, pioneering Australians wanted to be part of. And you've told us another tale of the next wave, and I can assure you that sitting in this room are more pioneering, visionary Australians who want to join you in remaking the world around us. So please, ladies and gentlemen, join me in thanking Vint one last time. Right.